Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 148 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We have tons of thank yous right away. We're just going to issue them. Oh, we are so appreciative of everyone's thinking of us. Yeah, and generosity. It really helps us keep the podcast flowing into your ears. Absolutely. So thank you to our new Patreons, Kirsten, Faith, Leslie, and Diane. And then we had some individual donations. You can give directly by sending us a check the old-fashioned way or through PayPal. And we had three listeners do that. Susan, Rain, and Tony. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you all. We really appreciate your kindness. We do. This is a follow-up from a long time ago. One of our listeners, and we talked about it on an episode, I don't remember, reached out and said, I can't find older episodes on my podcast player. Well, I learned that there's a button that I could click <laughs> in our hosting software, and now up to 300 episodes are available. You know, they're always available on our website. But now they should be available on your podcast player. Yeah, we're up to 148. So we have, well, almost double. Right. <laughs> to go. So years ahead. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. I saw a podcast that started recently and they're like episode 305. And I'm just like, they just started. And it's, so they started with number 300 was their first number, which made me laugh. and made me think about back in the day when you'd order checks, when you first started a checking account. The advice was don't start with number one, right. start higher. So people don't think you're a newbie. Yeah, I never thought to do that. That's so interesting. They started with 300. Mm -hmm. hmm. Tricks of the trade. Well, also a reminder about our read along. Yes, A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger. That's our read along for the first quarter, which is part of our year of reading Indigenous Writers. And we just want to point out, too, like when we say indigenous writers, we mean indigenous people who are writing about indigenous issues quite often or characters, not so much other people writing about indigenous people. Yeah, that's helpful. And we're really looking forward to it. After we record today, we're going to pick the winner of our giveaway. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the publisher for sending us a copy to give away. Yes, thank you so much. And we did do a quick YouTube video about the read along and... We don't go into detail about our read-alongs, really, when we announce them, because in part, like we said in the video, if you should choose to watch that, we'll put a link in the show notes. We don't like to have a lot of spoilers about what we're going to be reading, so we kind of like to keep it kind of a mystery so we can go on an adventure as we're reading. But one thing might be important to say to folks is that this is a YA novel, and it is more in the fantasy genre. Yeah. So I'm super excited about it. I don't know much about it, and that's okay with me. Absolutely. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, by the way. People, feel free to do that. One new thing that Chris has been doing is actually putting our episodes on our YouTube channel so you can listen directly from YouTube if you want. Yeah, that's something we've seen other podcasts doing. I guess some of their listeners appreciate that because they're on YouTube a lot. So we have the audio up there, which is a static image, and that's another way to, to listen to us. Yeah. And then we're doing a video usually like every other week. So on off podcast weeks, we'll do a video to keep in touch with folks there. Yeah. So subscribe and then you'll get a little note. So Chris, what are you currently reading? I'm still plugging away at The Possessed, Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them by Elif Bautuman on audio. I'm listening to that as part of Jenny's Reading Envy Russia for 2022. And I have to say, you know, I'm listening to it when I'm driving around in my car doing errands. And I've heard other readers say it gets a little long in some parts whether they're reading it or, or listening. And I do have to say a lot of it's going in one ear and out the other, but I hear funny things here and there. It's much more memoir-ish than necessarily about Russian writers. She's spending a lot of time in Uzbekistan right now. So there's a lot of Uzbek literature, hmm. which was a really interesting thing because Emily and I had this conversation one time about Native American peoples in what is now the United States and theories about how they got to this continent. And, you know, one of them is that there was a land bridge coming from Russia to Alaska and that people came down that way. And so listening to this audiobook, she mentions that there's a woman telling her about Uzbek traditions. And one of the old teachings is that people are made up of four things, earth, fire, water, 
and wind maybe i'm, I'm not sure I was gonna say, yeah but I'm, i don't know and i'm thinking like wow that is so much a basis of a lot of native american teachings too so it's going to be interesting to explore a lot of these connections that you don't think of yeah. as a white western person anyway yeah i'm 75 percent through the book and I'll, I'll finish it but you know like i said it's something stick and others just wash over me. Yeah. And I wonder if it would be different if you were reading the paper copy, because I know sometimes that happens to me with audio in general. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it has to do with the narrator and sometimes it has to do with the subject matter. Well, and with a lot of these names that are, you know, Russian, Eastern European names can be a challenge. I wouldn't even recognize a lot of the names probably if I saw them written because I've been hearing them mm -hmm. and probably vice versa. I think if I were reading it, I'd want to listen to the audio to be able to pronounce names and place names and things like that. Right. Yeah. So what are you reading? I picked up a copy of Otto Lenghi's Flavor, which is a new-ish cookbook by Yodam Otto Lenghi. I'm a huge fan of his cookbooks. I have behind me Oh, yeah, I, I see his, it right there. Yeah, yeah. I have Ottolenghi, I have Jerusalem, and I have Sweet, mm -hmm. which long-time listeners remember Sweet was the cookbook that had a lot of recall issues. <laughs> like there were problems with some of the recipes, and they issued new recipes over the interwebs, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting. He also has one called Plenty, which I don't own. But this one is specific to vegetables. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone who eats a lot of vegetables, I think you would really enjoy this cookbook. He wrote it in tandem with Ixta Belfredge, who works in his test kitchen. It's a beautiful cookbook. One of my goals is to do more reading of food writing, and this really served the purpose over the weekend I read. The beginning of cookbooks have a lot of introductions of why they wrote it, what it's about. And this cookbook is split into three sections of how you cook vegetables, and one of them is process. So how you cook them, you know, do you char them? Do you broil them? Do you grill them? And then it's pairing. So what you put with a vegetable will influence it. And then I believe the last one is... Nice and colorful. It is. It's a beautiful book. Produce. So where they really just break down the different kind of produce and how you can use it, how you can bring out more flavors from the different types of vegetables but my favorite part of the book is the very back. If you're someone who just likes flavor, they have what they call a section that's flavor bombs. <laughs> and so it's making a really spicy oil or a condiment of some kind. I really like this section. There's, I'm showing Chris the picture. They have a page where they show all of the different 23 options that they bring to this cookbook and they have them in these little jars. Yeah, they're like clear glass. So you can see all the different colors. Yeah. And like one of them is chipotle nuts, which if you look through the recipes throughout the book, they'll chop up some of these chipotle nuts and put them on top of something to give you a little flavor bomb. So it's a really beautiful book. I'm enjoying reading it and learning more. There are some ingredients that they're specialty ingredients. You have to order them, but they're very good in here about saying if you can't do that, then like black garlic is an example. They use black garlic and they're like, if you can't get that, you know, get garlic. Oh, I never <laughs> so, even heard of black garlic. Yeah, I know I hadn't either. So again, it's called Flavor and it's a beautiful cookbook. It's available now. Nice. I might have to scope that out. Laura wants to start eating more vegetables. I mean, we eat vegetables regularly, but just kind of jazz it up a little bit. Yeah, and they're starting to become the main course, that what they're calling the center of the plate mm -hmm. instead of having meat. And I know a lot of people are trying to at least go a couple days a week where their dinner is a vegetable instead of a meat because right. it's better for the environment. So. Yeah, she just made a cool thing that was the, the basis is kind of not couscous. What's the other thing that's similar? Quinoa. Quinoa, black beans, red pepper, and other things. And it was quite delicious. Yeah. We yeah. got a lot of meals out of that too. And quinoa has great protein. Yeah. So it's like a quinoa bowl yeah. type thing. I love mm. me a bowl. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, especially in the winter, you know, yeah. nice and warm and you can cuddle up on the couch and eat yep. or be proper and sit at the table with a candle. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing I'm reading, I have to say, Jenny, if you're listening, you have completely derailed my reading plans for 2022. <laughs> I spent so much time in like November, especially thinking about what I was going to read in 2022. And then I saw her reading Envy Russia 
Thank you, Jenny. Um, so I'm actually reading War and Peace. Yeah, I kind of can't see Chris over the copy of her War and Peace right. on the table. <laughs> We've mentioned that we're a little short. War and Peace is not a short book. It's not, a long book. Not at all. I had a copy on my shelves since 2007. I bought a translation when it first came out that was uh, the talk of the town. And it sat on my shelves forever. And then when I heard Jenny talk about the, I read it on her blog first, actually, the Russia thing. Of course, then I started noticing War and Peace on my shelves a little bit more. And then Colleen, our friend, mentioned that she was going to be doing War and Peace. And so I just went down that whole thought rabbit hole of should I, shouldn't I? And I did. So I'm enjoying it very much. I'm at the very beginning, but I'm really enjoying it so far. I think with a big book, you do kind of feel like an athlete at first, kind of doing (laughs) warm ups and preps and everything before you jump into the main game. It's a really enjoyable read so far. It reminds me a little bit of Jane Austen because of the relationships and then Edith Wharton because it's, you know, the upper crust. Mm-hmm. I will be reporting back about War and Peace for probably several episodes. All right. Um, I'm glad you're tackling it. I am too. It feels good. I have a little notebook. It was like a three pack that I got at Barnes and Noble Flame Tree Notebooks. Mm-hmm. They have all these book covers on them. So what I'm doing is I am jotting down a few notes about each chapter after I finish it, just like who was in it and what the main thing that happened was. That's a really good idea, because when I was reading Anna Karenina, I kind of had the intention of doing that. And then I was like, oh, by section, I'll write down things. And then I kind of lost my way on it. I mean, I was listening and reading. So I just kind of lost my way and I wish I had some notes to reflect back on. Yeah. And to keep things straight. Right. Yeah, that and just the physical act of doing it yeah. just helps you it somehow does. like visualize names a little bit better or, or things like that. Yeah. Are you doing the real names or are you doing letters or nicknames? Because the names are so long. You know what? They're not that bad. They're not. Um, I mean, I only read the first part of Anna Karenina. And these names don't seem as long to me. Okay. I mean, for the most part, they're like Prince Andre or Princess Anna. See, Anna Karenina, the names were long, and he said the names about 50 times per page. Okay. Yeah, this doesn't seem as intense to me, I have to say. There are the multiple names of different Mm -hmm. characters and stuff, and I'm trying not to get too caught up. My goal is to just keep reading Mm -hmm. and not get stuck in too many of the details. Yeah. I just mainly want to keep the character straight in terms of relationships and what's going on because already there's the whole thing. One of the guys, he's married and he's he's feeling trapped. He's acting like a big old victim at this point. And there's another guy who has the hots for somebody. Well, I don't want to give too many spoilers for somebody else's wife and she's pregnant. And so I can imagine we're going to have a lot of that kind of intrigue going on. And then there's, of course, the impending war with Napoleon. Sounds very Tolstoyan. Yes. <laughs> Well, I picked up another book from the library that I'm really excited about. I was up in West Hartford visiting the Gentleman Caller. They have a very wonderful Noah Webster library in the main part of town there. And I was browsing the new book section and came up with this notable native people, 50 indigenous leaders, dreamers, and change makers from past and present by Adrian Keene. And what I love about it is it's illustrated So the illustrations are by Sierra Sena. She has a person with a beautiful illustration and then just one page about them and why they're important, kind of a title of what they are, and then their tribe also. I wanted to just read a little note that the author wrote in the introduction about tribal names because that's something, if you watch that YouTube video that Chris and I I kind of questioned, like, do you say tribe? I don't even know if that's appropriate anymore. And so she says, a note on tribal names. Tribal names can be a bit tricky. There are officially federally recognized names and more colloquial versions of those names, widely used but not preferred, names given by settlers, as well as native language names and other names that may be preferred by tribal members. Many of the names you may be familiar with, such as Sioux, for Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, or Winnebago, for Ho-Chunk, were names given by settlers and do not come from native languages, so many of these names are not preferred or are falling out of favor. Some settler-given names, however, like Osage, are considered acceptable and widely used. 
When noting the tribes to which they belong, Native people may also choose to include or not include their specific band or clan affiliations. In this book, for the sake of simplicity and to the best of my knowledge, I have used the tribal names most commonly used and accepted by members of those tribes, as well as the tribal names preferred by the people in this book. So I think she queried the people. Now, some of them have passed away, but she queried them when she placed them in the book. So some of the tribal names, for example, are Sikangu Lakota, Kanaka Maoli, which are on the Hawaiian Islands, Sac and Fox, Luiseno Kumiai. So it's a really interesting book. And I've just been reading about a couple people every day. So this is one that I'm going to, until I have to return it, <laughs> I'm going to be reading for quite some time. And also she does have folks that like this one I just turned to, Bobby Jean Three Legs, was born in 1992, super young. And she is an environmental activist, Standing Rock Lakota, Cheyenne River Lakota. And then she has some folks that are much older and have passed away represented as well. Super cool book. Yeah, sounds like it. Again, that's called Notable Native People by Adrienne Keene. Is it for young adults? No. it's mm -mm. Okay. I thought it was at first, but it was not. It's in the adult section. And it's also by Ten Spreed Press, which ironically is also the press for the Adelengi Flavor Cookbook. So Hmm. this is a press I also want to check out more of because both of these books are beautiful. They are. They have very lovely colors and illustrations and photographs. So what did you just read? Oh my goodness. I did a lot of reading and I finished the book Honor by Thridi Umergar, which I talked a lot about on the last episode. So I won't get carried away talking about it because we have a lot to talk about. But I do want to make a correction, which... The book is mostly about two women whose lives become intertwined. One of them is a journalist from the States who is asked to go to India to cover a story about another woman who lives in a very rural part of India. They had a Hindu and a Muslim marriage, and the bride's brothers did not approve of this marriage. And set the home on fire where this couple lived, killing the husband and burning their sister. So the story is about the trial that then takes place and how the journalist comes to report on the trial and how these two women get to know each other. I misspoke and said that in India, it's not allowed for a Hindu and a Muslim to marry. That's in this particular rural small town. That's the case. In progressive cities like Mumbai, that is not the case. So I didn't want to represent the country as a whole with that statement. It's a very intense book and lots of trigger warnings in this book for violence. So if you're not someone who can handle that in a novel, I would definitely avoid it. But I did really enjoy the writing and the study kind of on motherhood and family and expectations and religious zealotry. I thought Thrifty Umrigar handled it all really well. So again, that's called Honor. Oh, so intense. Yeah. Well, the book I'm going to talk about is more on the fun side of novels as they go. It is The Peacock by Isabel Bogdan translated from the German by Annie Rutherford. This book, it's a bestseller in Germany. It's written by a German woman, originally in German, but set in Scotland. Oh, how interesting. Which is kind of not your typical German novel, I guess. It's a bit of a whodunit and also a comedy of errors because there's this old lord and lady who live in this crumbling castle and they have cottages on the property that used to be workers' cottages and now they're renting them out So they're cottages with a little kitchen and stuff. So people can come and stay for quite a while or just a weekend. And they have peacocks on the property. And one of them starts attacking things that are blue. (laughs) So there's a couple at the beginning of the book who are from India, but they're living in England, I believe. And their car is attacked by the peacock because it's blue. (laughs) So, so random. yes, and it's a quirky piece of land that the Lord and the lady own. He's actually a classics professor and she's an engineer who designs stuff like windmills, energy windmills. I know there's a better name for them. Wind turbines. Wind turbines, right. But then they also have to maintain the land 
So renting out the cottages is a way for them to get money to do the repairs that are needed on the property. <laughs> the thing that they're getting ready for is a big banking group coming. It's a small group of people, but they are important, highfalutin folks. And they feel like if this goes well, if we can do a good job of putting these people up and letting them have their retreat, they're really hoping that they'll be able to get more people coming in, spending more money to help them with the upkeep. So the group that comes in, the boss is a woman, and there are three guys on the team. There's also a cook who's a woman and a psychologist who's a facilitator of team building. And it's her first time on the job. Comedy of errors, like I said, something happens that one person tries to cover up, other people see things and they make their own stories up about what's going on. And it, it just keeps snowballing. And speaking of snowballing, a big snowstorm comes and they get kind of stuck there. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So it was a fun book. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give any spoilers. But if you're looking for something that's fun, I, I would say pretty much on the light side. You know, it's one of those books where people do discover things about themselves and about their coworkers. And you kind of find out what people do when they're making up stories about things to try and make things better and, and how that works out. <laughs> So, <laughs> and I just want to say this is from V&Q Books, which stands for Voland and Quist, which is a German publisher. This is a new line that's headed up by Katie Derbyshire, who is a translator. She translates German into English. And so she's heading up this new imprint. It's only available now in Europe and the UK at this point. They're not distributing to North America but I was able to order this and some others from them via book depository. And I'm kind of bummed that they're not distributing in North America because they have a subscription where you can get their forthcoming books. And I would love to do that. Like I've been kind of holding back on doing a book subscription, but this is one I would do because their titles sound really different. Like this yeah. one, you know, this is not your standard literary novel. It's not your standard type of novel that would be translated normally. Yeah. Well, so, maybe that's coming. Yeah, I hope so. So again, that was The Peacock by Isabel Bogdan, available now. Little aside, you know, when I lived in Ohio, I had a rental attached to the back of my house and I called it a B&B, &B, which stood for bed and beyond, <laughs> that you had to create your own beyond. And it did have a little kitchen. But one morning someone knocked on my back door like, when's breakfast? <laughs> And I happened to be making pancakes for my kids at the time. So I was like, well, I, you could have pancakes with my kids. That was not very appealing to them. I don't think that's what they expected. <laughs> that's so funny. I, one time early on, you know, doing a B&B &B and didn't really know much about the etiquette, we skipped breakfast. Mm -hmm. And then we got scolded later by the host because she was like, where were you? I was waiting for you. I'm like, oh, God, sorry. You had no idea. You know, yeah. we, we just went out early and explored the town, you know. So. I know. It's for some people and not for others, the whole B&B &B thing. Yeah. Well, after reading several heavy books in a row, I mean, several, I decided to read something super light and fun. So I read Yinka, Where Is Your Husband? <laughs> And this is by Lizzie Damalola Blackburn. It is a debut. It's out now. It came out on the 18th of the mm -hmm. month. I thought I would read to you the very front husband because the book is spelled H-U-Z-B-A-N-D, pronounced husband, noun, one, a male partner in a marriage. Example, Yinka's younger sister, Kemi, is married to Uchi. Two, a non-existent man in a non-existent marriage whose whereabouts is often asked, usually by Ni Nigerian mums and aunties, of single British Nigerian women. Example, so, Yinka, where is your husband? Ah, uh, ah, uh, you're 31 now. <laughs> so that's the very beginning of the book. So that gives you some insight into what this book is about. If you like Bridget Jones' diary, it's got that similar kind of light fun read to it. She is a young woman in her 30s in London, living her best life. Her career is going really well until it doesn't. And she has a friend that's, or I think a cousin that's going to get married. And so she sets a goal for herself to have a date by the wedding. She doesn't want to show up to the wedding single. 
and all manner of things ensue. But really, it's about finding yourself because she tries to change herself in order to find a partner. And we all know how well that works, right? So super fun friends and family, very culturally rich in the Nigerian culture with food and language. I really enjoyed it. If you're looking for a fun, easy read, I highly recommend it. I will say that there was one word that came up that I didn't know. And then it came up again in another book I just finished. So I finally decided to look it up. I'm curious if you know what it means, Chris, to be catfished. Oh, gosh, to be catfished. No, but I know I've heard that before. And it's one of those things I look it up to. It's to lure someone into a relationship by means of a fictional online persona. Wow. I had no idea. Being ghosted is another yeah. you know, term you hear, or gaslit. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, these are all kind of newish terms for my middle-aged okay. self. I don't remember the, being an online thing, but wow, yeah. So she tries to do some online dating, mm-hmm. and so that's why that term comes up there. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. It was fun. There's a little thread also of philanthropy because she does some volunteering and meets some people through that and kind of finds herself anew when she's in that. So I appreciated that as well. Very cool. So again, it's called Yinka, Where Is Your Husband? by Lizzie Damalola Blackburn out now. Nice. (laughs) Well, I am starting another surprising trend in my reading this year that I didn't anticipate. It's reading picture books. Laura bought me one for Christmas and that kind of set me off. I'm back in school again, so I'm doing a lot of heavy reading. I'm taking a establishing and managing archives class. So that's a lot of management at this point. We're doing strategic plans, grants, budgets, all those kinds of things. And then the other class I'm taking is intro to programming where we're learning Python. That's really kind of heavy, dryish writing sometimes, even though I'm interested in it, obviously. And then I'm picking up warm peace. Like, what am I thinking? (laughs) So at nighttime, when I want to read to relax a little bit and not have a book like warm peace fall on my head and give me a concussion... I'm looking at picture books on my iPad, which are just delightful. Two of them that I read that um, I really enjoyed, it's The Good Egg and then also The Bad Seed by Jory John and Pete Oswald. The Good Egg was the first that I came across, came out in 2019, and it's about this little egg who is the good egg. And all the other eggs in his carton are really kind of violent and disruptive and destructive And he's so good. He's always trying to make other people be good and behave and things like that. And he gets so stressed out that he starts having cracks and more cracks are forming. So he strikes on it on his own and eventually finds himself. And he realizes self-care is really important. Oh, what a great theme. Yes. And I really thought about stressed out, tired parents reading this to their kid at night and getting something out of it as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. So then, you know, the little egg comes home and the story has a conclusion. So then I wanted another book by them. And that was when I checked out The Bad Seed. This is an earlier book, actually. It came out in 2017. It's about a little sunflower seed who is really bad. Like he always does the wrong thing. I don't know why I'm saying he. I don't remember if it was a gendered seed or not. Always doing the wrong thing, you know, cutting in line, not washing hands or feet, always being late. I thought, oh, am I a bad seed? It's one of my traits. I'm trying to break. But then it's so funny. I have to show Emily this. There's on one page, a whole body picture of the seed saying, I'm a bad seed. And then the next page, it's a close up on just his eyes and eyebrows. I'm a bad seed. (laughs) And his eyebrows are like furrowed. And he's a sunflower seed. Yes. So the story of the sunflower seed is once upon a time in a very happy family, But then the sunflower's head drooped and the flower's petals came off and then all the seeds fell out. And he got raked up, found himself in a sunflower seed bag, got spit out during a ball game, landed on a piece of gum under the bleachers, and then is all alone and really angry about his circumstances. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty dark. Yeah. Yeah. So this little seed's out on his own and he has a realization one day when he sees himself in this little piece of mirror and decides that he's going to be happy and he's going to work on his attitude. And from there on, then you eventually get to the end of the book. 
they have more in this whole series. So I, I look forward to finding more. So if you want to pick up some children's picture books, which I highly recommend because I feel so much better after reading them. And these lessons are really good for you no matter what age you are. That is by Jory John and Pete Oswald, The Good Egg and the Bad Seed. Very good. Does it affect your dreams at all, I wonder? Are you someone who remembers your dreams? I do if I wake up in Mm -hmm. the middle of the night. Because that seems like kind of a nice thing. Definitely better than reading like the headlines in the news Mm, before you go to bed. So good for you. Those sound great. I haven't had any dreams about eggs or seeds, but I'll have to pay attention to that. Yeah, I wonder. Hmm. Well, my next book was The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Mm. Holy (laughs) tamale. This book was so good, everybody. It is of the moment. It takes place in current day. And when I say that, I really mean current day this time instead of I think I said that about 1989 last episode. (laughs) But during the time of the pandemic, during the time of George Floyd, because it takes place in Minnesota. Louise Erdrich owns a bookstore in Minnesota called Birch Bark Books. This is a work of fiction, but it does take place largely around a bookstore that is, you know, is her bookstore. And I mean, I think they even refer to it as Birch Bark Bark Books. The main character is Tukey, who, when the book opens, ends up in prison for doing something that they should not do. But now the main part of the book is 10 years later, after coming out of prison and now working at the bookstore. The thing that Louise Erdrich does so well with this book is it's actually, there's a lot of humor in it, even though there's so much darkness. You know what I mean? And that's just such a skill. Mm -hmm. So there are like customers that come in that they give funny nicknames to that are funny. And just the dialogue is really spectacular as well. She does a fantastic job there. But the other thing that's happening is that one of the customers, Flora, has passed away and is now haunting the bookstore. <laughs> so there's there's a lot going on. But the thing I wanted to say also is that the sentence, the title for the book, the sentence, has multiple meanings. And she kind of gives you the definition of a sentence. And then there are sentences in books that are important. And then Tukey's prison sentence is another aspect, right? Yeah. So that's interesting. The other thing is there are so many book references. I mean, Olga Tarkachuk gets book referenced. So many that we've read and that we know about that it's a book lover's book in general. Yeah, I highly recommend it. I both read it and listened to it. And Louise Erdrich narrates the audio. Oh, so cool. And she does a fantastic job. I didn't know that. I have to tell you that. And when it ended, I was like, oh, my God, the narrator was so good. I want to look it up so I can, when I'm talking about it, I can make sure. And then I was like, what? Because a lot of authors will admit I shouldn't narrate my own book. This is not my skill set. You know, Mm -hmm. she did a fantastic job. So there's lots of fun relationships with the people who visit the bookstore and shop there. Tuki also, she's partnered and has a stepchild through that who has a child. So she has a step-grandchild, and that relationship is really sweet as well. So of the moment, during COVID, Haunted Bookstore, fantastic read. The Sentence by Louise Erdrich, highly recommend. Very cool. (laughs) That one is definitely going on my list. Yeah, and again, great audiobook. The other book I finished is called Her Last Affair by John Searles. This is not out until March 22nd. Who this book was so interesting. It had kind of a creepy psycho vibe, hmm. if you know the movie Psycho. So there are three characters whose lives somehow become intertwined. I mean, there was a point when I was reading it when I was like, oh, this is, actually feels like short stories. But eventually it all makes sense. Skyla lives at an out-of-business drive-in movie theater with two identical houses on the property, which you find out why there are two identical houses on the property as you're reading the book. She's suffering from loss of vision due to macular degeneration. She was a nurse, and she wears a nurse's uniform and a necklace of keys that go to all of the buildings on the property. Am I painting a creepy enough picture yes, for you? Are. <laughs> the beginning of the book, she's looking for a tenant to occupy the second identical 
house on the property for a little income and also kind of as a set of eyes since she's lost her vision. And then Linnell is another character who's living an unfulfilled marriage. And she has recently lost her job because one of her friends posted a not too glamorous picture for someone who's a teacher on Facebook from her youth, but still it haunted her and she got fired. And then Jeremy is a down and out writer who's on his way to Providence, Rhode Island to write a restaurant review. So these are the three main characters. Their lives seem and feel very different, but John Searles brings them all together Hmm. with themes of heartbreak, first love, marriage gone wrong, and maybe a little murder. Those all sound like things that are very much enhanced by a drive-in theater setting. (laughs) And someone walking around in a nurse's uniform with keys on a necklace. (laughs) Yeah, when you said it's kind of psycho, I thought psycho in general, but now you painted the specific picture of the movie too. Yeah, yeah. And oh, the, each chapter has a quote from a film that played at the drive-in, which was really so cool, cool too. I know. So yeah. did he base this on any particular theater or just the time period? I don't know. I mean, if you look at the cover, it's got a really cool picture of kind of a drive-in theater that's been ha- seen better days. And then the name of it, you know, I never thought to look it up, but in the book, the name of it is the Shodak Big Star Drive-In. Hmm. Yeah. So her last affair, John Searles, out March 22nd. The last book I finished was Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow. This is a debut novel that's out on March 3rd. This book, I think, is going to go places. It's really wonderful. Tara is a poet, so it's written very beautifully with a lot of memorable lines. I highlighted it up all over the place. I got this as an e-arc. Thank you to Dial Press, I think is the name of the publisher. It's about three generations of women. There's a family tree in the front, which is very accessible. I kind of giggled when I looked at it because compared to the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, there's like six characters, I think. So I was like, oh, I can do this, you know. <laughs> And um, it's told in three parts, and then each part has different points of view and different time frames. And I will say the only thing is that it can be a little confusing because she goes back and forth in time, very different kind of times, like 1968, 2001, 1991, 2000. So you really have to pay attention, but each chapter has the character name and the date. So I just took a pause each time placed myself with that person and who they were in the story. And there are several time periods. It's definitely an ode to Memphis, Tennessee, and Tara is from Memphis. So you really get a feeling for the Black experience there from the time of the Civil Rights Movement onward. And also, it's an ode to her family. I mean, when you read the acknowledgments, there's a lot of her family in there, including the fact that her grandmother was one of the first black nurses in Memphis, Tennessee, and also that her grandfather, who served in the war in World War II, came home, became the first black homicide detective in Memphis, and was lynched. And that is woven into this story. So there's a lot of darkness, but there's also a lot to be hopeful about. And her dialogue is amazing. I mean, the story just flowed. I could not put this book down. Wow. When I started it, I was like, okay, work's going to hell in a handbasket. I'm reading this book until I'm done. <laughs> it's definitely a love song to mothers and daughters, what mothers will do for their kids and what they also will give up in order for their kids to have success. There's also a thread I thought of you because there's a thread of Marines One of the fathers in the story is a Marine, and he's at Camp Lejeune. (laughs) So I thought of my fellow book cougar when I was reading that. And some PTSD is also represented in it from both the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. So there's a thread of the military as well. Again, it's called Memphis. It's out March 3rd. I highly recommend that you pre-order or ask your library to get this one. Sounds good. I I love a book with good dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know who it reminded me of, too, was Pat Conroy. Really? Yeah. Because of that military piece and just the family and big, boisterous family members and that. And very Southern, of course, Mm -hmm. you know. That's some high praise. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She's going places, I think. Unless sometimes people have one story in them. I know she does a lot of poetry writing also, but who knows if she'll do more novel writing. Yeah, right. Not everybody wants to keep writing novels. I mean, sometimes for some people, one is enough. Yeah. They go on to other things with their life. So did you go on any Biblio adventures? You know, I did. I had a couple, actually. They were all couch Biblio adventures at this point. I did finish the final season of Dickinson. So that one's on Apple. That was planned as three seasons about the life of Emily Dickinson. I'm so glad I watched that. I don't think the third season was my favorite necessarily, but how they resolve things with the final episode, I thought was kind of interesting because... Emily Dickinson during her lifetime as portrayed in this series wasn't really valued by her family as a poet, not by her parents anyway. Her siblings knew her talent. You get to see some nods towards the future that will be Emily Dickinson's reputation. Oh, that's fun. So to say. Yeah. yeah. Was a little good. artistic license with that, right? Because that was not true in her lifetime at all, was it? Not really, no. Mm-mm. Yeah. But she was also sick, Wasn't she? And did they portray her that way? No, she wasn't sick in her younger years. You know, she developed an eye problem at one point and she did die, I think, fairly young. Not sure if she's in her 40s or 50s. Okay. I don't remember offhand, but she wasn't like a sickly child or young person by any means. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I thought that maybe I'm confusing her with somebody. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's so many different mythologies surrounding her. Just the whole thing of a tiny woman, tiny, (laughs) you know, this short, petite woman who lives and stays at home for the most part and just wears this white dress. I mean, you think of her as a frail Mm -hmm. person if you buy into that mythology which is, I think, what people of our generation were taught about her. Yeah. I thought she had a kidney disease or something. Am I confusing her with Louisa May Alcott? Maybe. <laughs> oh, my God. The, Louisa May Alcott makes an, a couple appearances in the series. I love what they did with her. Oh. And then um, there's one of the, my favorites is the one with Thoreau. <laughs> Oh. oh my God, so funny. <laughs> I mean, and again, it's not to everyone's taste. If you don't like historical time period mashups... This wouldn't be for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I really enjoyed it. Well, I attended the Rhode Island, reading across Rhode Island. It was their kickoff event last night. The panelists were Lauren M. Spears, Silver Moon Mars LaRose, and Maureen Nagel. The book they have picked is Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully, which is so good, y'all. If you haven't read it, highly recommend. Great audiobook as well. They're doing something different because this is a book that's very much about indigenous people. They've invited Lauren Spears to be the master of ceremonies for the whole year, which I think is really cool. She's the executive director of the Tomaquag Museum in Rhode Island, which I think should be a future biblio adventure. I had no idea it exists. It's a really cool museum all about indigenous people. They're actually fundraising to open up a different building, I think. They need more space. But it was a really good conversation just about why they chose the book and what the events are going to be in the coming year. So I just wanted to point it out to people because you can go to their website, which is ribook.org, and they have lots of resources for the year, including resources for teachers. So any listeners out there that are teachers that want to teach this book, and get their resources, it's available whether or not you live in Rhode Island. That doesn't matter. Because this is really for older, it's a YA book, but it's really for upper high school age. They also are doing some buddy reads. One of them is Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, which I thought was fun. And she's going to be appearing on April 15th to talk with them about that. So I'll try to attend that. And then they're doing some other books, like for younger kids. I think one of them was called We Are Water Protectors. They also have a book club in a bag. If you are in Rhode Island, you can go to the local libraries and they have it set up with the book and everything. Really fun to just see the enthusiasm for this book. A lot of states do these 
one read, one book. So I know when I lived in Ohio, they did. So um, you might look for that. Usually the libraries are driving forces behind that and will have information for you. Very cool. Yeah. Another event I attended also concerned Indigenous people. This was an event through the Madison Historical Society right here in Connecticut with the executive director of the Institute for American Indian Studies, which is here in Connecticut, Dr. Lucien Lavin talked about Connecticut's indigenous peoples. One of the really striking things about this talk was that before Europeans came to what is now known as Connecticut, there were a dozen or more tribes here. And now the state of Connecticut only recognizes five or six tribes. What's really interesting is that over the years, as tribes have been recognized by the government, the federal government recognized more, but the state of Connecticut actually had that overturned because, you know, so much of this deals with financial matters. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I'm very curious to look into and learn more about. But the Institute for American Indian Studies is a museum. That's where I had a surprise birthday present for Laura lined up. They actually have a wigwam escape room. That is so cool. And I thought that would be so cool because Laura loves wigwams. I thought the escape room would be very unique. We've never done an escape room. Unfortunately, COVID canceled those plans. But I look forward to having this be a book cooker's biblio adventure in the future as things calm down a little bit more with the pandemic. But that was really thorough. Dr. Lavin definitely knows her stuff. So there are a lot of different aspects covered. I don't know if that event is available to stream unless you registered because they asked for a donation. It's uh, through the Madison Historical Society. Lots of food for thought with that. Yeah, and I'll look it up in, in the event that it is. I will definitely link it in the show notes. Yeah, the Madison Historical Society, they always have a theme that guides their book clubs and the lectures that they have. Their theme this year is is also focusing on Indigenous peoples. Yeah, I look forward to checking out more of the events that the Madison Historical Society has this year. Yeah. So then the other biblio adventure I have is ongoing. I'm actually watching Sex and the City for the first time. Really? I never watched it when it was on TV. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't either. I mean, I watched it much later by... DVD. Okay. (laughs) Or maybe VHS. No, DVD. (laughs) Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Sex in the City is based on a book by Candace Bushnell, which came out in 1996, which I also downloaded the ebook from the library. And Laura watched it, so she's familiar. And I happened to walk in on her watching one of the newer episodes because they have a new series. And I got kind of interested in some of the characters. And I was like, I'd go back and watch the beginning. And she was willing. So we're into season two at this point. And even just from the first pages of the book that I read, you can see a lot of the storylines and the themes are bam right there in the beginning of the book, which is a collection of essays because Candace was a columnist reporter. And that's the character played by Sarah Jessica Parker is a reporter. Right? Yeah. I mean, well, an she's a columnist. Yeah. yeah. She has this column yeah. about sex in the city. Yeah. It's pretty wild. It really is of a time. Mm-hmm. But it's also giving me that New York fix that I miss going to New York so much. Yeah, me too. It's definitely getting that. It's also one of those series that if you're looking for something, there's a lot of seasons. So you can really dig in and have something fun to get you through the, the cold months if you're in a cold weather place. Right. Yeah. And it's funny, too, because there's some digs against Connecticut, because, you know, Manhattanites especially have right. this thing with Connecticut. <laughs> but Candace Bushnell grew up in Connecticut, in Glastonbury is where she's from. And oh. she went to New York, I guess, for college when she was 19 and has stayed there. Hmm. I did not know that. Fun yeah. fact. So any upcoming jaunts on your calendar? Well, just a play day with you tomorrow. I know. I'm so excited. Our plans are morphing and changing. We're not exactly sure, but we know it will involve bookstores. Yes. (laughs) That doesn't shock anybody. (laughs) Maybe a library. We'll see. (laughs) We had plans to go into Boston, but we might be changing that. We will report back on episode 149. Yeah. I'm just happy to get some cougar time. Absolutely. (laughs) What about you? I see something on your list there. I have a Buzz Books editor's panel tonight. 
When we used to go to Book Expo, that was one of the fun parts of it. They would do these editor panels where they would all champion a book that they're really excited about. So I got an email that they're doing one tonight, so I'm going to attend. So I'll report back on what the books are that are buzzing for spring. Excellent. Good. Look forward to hearing about that. Any upcoming reads on your list? Yes, I have one that I just found out about today from Imani Perry. It's called South to America, A Journey Below the Mason-Dixon to Understand the Soul of America. This just came out yesterday, January 25th from Echo Press. And she has an essay or an interview in Lit Hub. That is how I came across this. And she's originally from Alabama, but has spent most of her life outside of the South. But that's where her family is from, and that is always such a huge part of her consciousness. And so I look forward to reading the book just based on that interview. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I have two on my TBR. One of them is really far out of my wheelhouse. It's called Goliath by Tochi Anyabuchi, and he's the author of Riot Baby, if um, his name sounds familiar. The reason this is out of my wheelhouse is this is like a world-building sci-fi. It takes place in 2050, I believe. It's blurbed on the front by Lee Bardugo. And she says, Anya Bucci sets fire to the boundary between fiction and reality, riveting, disturbing, and rendered in masterful detail. I started to read about it a little bit. It's about a gay couple that comes down from, I don't want to say outer space, because it's like they've made places to live, space station or whatever. I'm not sure how he's going to refer to it. And they come back here, stateside, I guess. Earth side. Yeah, earth side, (laughs) stateside. So that's as much as I know about it. I'm hoping that I enjoy it because I've been spending some time in dark stories and I want something a little bit different. How did that one cross your path? It's being talked about a lot. So I requested a copy Hmm. and one arrived. Thank you to Tor. Nice. Yeah. Tor does some great stuff. They do really great stuff. It also has a fantastic cover. And then the other one is called Free Love. This is out. Well, Goliath, let's see. Goliath just came out yesterday. Okay. And then Free Love comes out on the first. So the day that this episode drops. Tessa Hadley is from Wales. And I think she's really revered and well known there. I mean, Hilary Mantel waxes poetic about her. I don't know much about what it's about, except that it's a woman's sexual and intellectual awakening. Mm. Who doesn't like the sounds of that? In 1960s London. Oh, dear. Yes. (laughs) Very different books. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say 2050 is not that far away. I know it seems so far away, but we're in 2022. There's another book that's on my radar. I don't know. I I wouldn't be getting to it anytime soon, but I might eyeball it for Sue's Big Book Summer Reading Challenge. Olga Tukerchuk's new one is like a thousand pages. It is. I know. I mean, it's not new. It's been in Polish for a while, but it just was translated into English. Yeah. So we'll see. I saw our buddy Russell had a copy of it in his hands. I saw that on social media. Yeah. Yeah, And people are talking about it. Yeah. I'd really like to read it. Mm -hmm. Oh my, y'all. So many books. So many. And it's just beautiful when it's not overwhelming. Yes. (laughs) As she says behind her huge copy of War and Peace. (laughs) Well, everyone, we wish you so much. Happy Happy reading. reading. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from Libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. This episode is edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.